Good morning, Trinity. Hope you're doing well today. Let me invite you to stand to your feet. We're going to sing some songs to Jesus this morning and worship Him with our voices, with our hearts. One salvation, one doorway that leads to life, one redemption, one confession. I believe in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe. I believe in the crucifixion. By his blood I have been set free. I believe in the resurrection hallelujah his life is destiny all praise all praise to god the father all praise to christ the son all praise to the holy spirit our god has overcome the king who was and is and evermore will be Jesus mighty
All praise to God the Father. Amen. make this our prayer this morning. God, would you open our eyes to see, open our eyes to see your goodness at work. Everywhere we go and in everything we see and do, may this be true. And all throughout my history, your faith has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see, and I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life Yes, Lord, we are so thankful and grateful for your faithfulness to us. How day after day, moment after moment, you are always with us. You are always speaking to us. You're leading us and guiding us in the ways that we should go. What more could we ask from you, God? But can you help us to be faithful to you in response to your great faithfulness? 
May it be so. Lord Jesus, may it be so. Amen and amen. You can have a seat for just a moment. Well, welcome and good morning. Welcome to Trinity Baptist Church. My name is Pastor Brian. Uh, I've had a privilege of meeting most of you, but if I haven't had a chance to meet you, um, I hope to and hope to get to know you a little bit more. Trinity is a community of faith that's committed to worshiping God growing together and making a difference. And we have people from all different walks of life, all ages and stages, all different. And we would love to invite you to do that as well. A really easy way to get some information, uh, to learn a little bit more about what does it look like to connect with this community of faith is simply to fill out the yellow card that's in the pew in front of you. For those on the live stream, uh, there's information in the description of the live stream. And today... This is not for the live stream people unless you can like turn off the stream and get here quickly. Today, if you're in the room, you're new, newish. It's been a while since you've been here at Trinity. Let me invite you. We have a special opportunity after the service called Bagels with Brian. It's just a casual time, uh, no set agenda. There's not a meeting you're going to sit through. It's literally just an opportunity to shake hands, get to know each other a little bit more, and have some carbs. I mean, that's a great deal, right? It's a great deal. Uh, if that's you, we would love for you to join us. It's simply down the stairs in the first room on your right. I'll be there. Marty will be there. Bagels will be there. It's a win. It's a win. Let me invite you immediately after the service uh, today. Now, we have a lot of things going on. I know it feels like Easter was three weeks ago, not one week ago, but there's a lot of things going on. One thing I want to highlight and invite you to hear a little bit more about is actually an upcoming event that we have at the Women's Conference. So let me invite Susanna up to come and tell us just a little bit more about this event, um, help us understand what it is and why it matters for people I just to want to say connected. good morning, church. Good morning, live streamers. <laughs> I'm, I've been a live streamer for a while because I haven't been well, so I just want to know that you are part of this invitation as well. That's awesome. So tell us just a little bit about what this event is and why do you think it's going to be so important for women to connect with this this year? Sure. I mean... We are all hearing um, sound bites all the time about mental health, mental health, kids are depressed, women are depressed, you know, men aren't doing well. And the interesting thing is they're not really telling you that you have to identify and address the physical, the mental, and the spiritual aspects in order to achieve that abundant life that Jesus has promised us. And I am so troubled because I think a lot of us Christians are living subpar lives. Mm -hmm. And this conference is going to help you figure out what your weaknesses are, and we have specifically designed skills to help strengthen you. And I don't want us living subpar lives. The world is so crazy as it is right now. We need to be fully charged in the Holy Spirit in order to shine like lights the way Christ has created us. You know, and what I love about that is I think that's really what everybody's looking for is this desire to live a life that's lived to the fullest, mm -hmm. that's honoring God, that's making a difference in the community in which you live. And how we integrate mental health with our faith is a really important part of that. So um, let me encourage you, check out the details. There's a QR code. You can sign up, mark it down in your calendar. Uh, we would love just to see a ton of people there. And more importantly, we'd love to see what happens in people's lives in the weeks and months that follow. So I just have one more thing that I want to say. Tell me one more thing, Susanna. It's really important uh, because I advocated for this. There is child care. Oh, oh hallelujah. Wow. And it's free of charge. Okay, so this is a fabulous opportunity to come and have a day to focus just on yourselves from 9 to 3.30. Your kids will be taken care of. You don't have to cook. And you'll be able to, I know I'm looking forward to seeing old friends that I haven't seen, but more importantly, making new friends. I see all these new faces here. I see you, and I really want to get to know you better. So please, please come. We're looking forward to it. And thank you for this opportunity. Child care. I feel yes. like we need to Talk about husband care. Is there a husband care thing? What, is there something? Thank you, Susanna. Um, let me invite you today as we continue in worship 
to create some space in your heart and your minds because there's so many things that are going on. It feels like it's been a whirlwind of a week, of a season. Are we done with winter? Are we not done with winter? I don't even know what's happening with the weather. This is a moment for you to hear from God. And so let me invite you to just create some space in your heart and in your mind. And maybe it just sounds a simple prayer, something like this. God, would you speak to me? And I tell you, we get here early. No one gets here earlier than Marty. He's the earliest. But we get here early. And we actually walk through these pews and we pray for you. And for those who are tuning in from home, we're praying for you. That today is so much more than just the sum of efforts or putting on some show that each one of us will encounter the living God. So Father in heaven, today, give us grace to hear from you. Would you speak? Would you move? Because Father, we believe it's for your glory, for your honor and our good. And all God's people said, amen. Stand with us as we continue to worship today. spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Still you give yourself away Shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, light won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, light won't tear down. Coming out to me, oh, it's true. There's no shadow you won't lie it out. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming out to me.
We thank you, God, in your faithfulness, Lord, you, you continue to pursue us. Out of your great love for us, God. And we just want to say thank you and remind ourselves that he loves us, oh, how he loves us, oh, how he loves us, oh, how he loves us. He loves us, oh, how he loves us, oh, how he loves us. Yes, he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. Thank you. seated. And I'd like to uh, invite up at this point, uh, Sarah Page is going to come and uh, just share some things with us about something, um, a really exciting chance that's coming up in the summer, but also just an update on things that are happening uh, going on in Rwanda. Please welcome Sarah. Hi, um, so my name is Sarah Page. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the deacon of Trinity's Rwanda Missions. Um, and I am excited to share uh, that we will be sending a team again this year um, to Rwanda in August. Um, with the exception of the pandemic years, we have organized teams every year over the last 20 years, um, with this upcoming trip being our 22nd. So praise God for that provision. Um, our teams build relationships, learn needs, and serve the people of Rwanda. As a result, Trinity's Rwanda Missions has grown into a strong partnership with the people of Rwanda, and specifically in the Yamagabe district. On this year's trip, we will deepen our partnership with the Rwandan-led organization, African New Life Ministries, by hosting trainings and community events at the New Life Bible Church in Yamagabe. That's a picture inside the church. Um, that's the church that through this congregation's generosity, we helped build just a few short years ago. It's gonna be um, a special trip, a special time. So, Today, April 7th, um, marks 30 years since the start of the genocide that occurred in Rwanda. Over just three short months, almost a million people were killed. It's unfathomable. And when you visit Rwanda, the impact of the genocide is palpable to this day. It's everywhere, in profound sorrow and pain, but also in remarkable resilience and reconciliation. Acknowledging this, I'm reminded how important it is that we travel back there year after year. In Rwandan culture, traveling a long way to see someone in need is an act of compassion and care and is greatly respected. When we go there, we show God's love. Relationships and interactions are the most essential element of our service. And the training and discipleship that we do is so significant and so deeply needed, given how prevalent is the need for healing and forgiveness through Christ. 
If you'd like to be a part of God's transforming work in Rwanda, there's details in the bulletin and how to contact me. And I'll also be in fellowship hall after service. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Finally, given the significance of today's date, I'd like to end my time up here in prayer. Please join me. Thank you, God, for calling Trinity to partner with and serve the people of Yamagabe. Thank you for preparing paths for us to walk in in order to support the community and to grow your kingdom. Thank you for how you have uniquely equipped and empowered our congregation. Thank you for blessing us, Lord, to be a blessing to others. Today, we pray for Rwandans all over the world who are in reflection who may be experiencing pain while thinking about unimaginable trauma and loss. We pray for healing. We pray for reconciliation. We pray for unity. And ultimately, Jesus, we pray for knowledge of you, belief in you, and freedom in you. Amen. Thank you. is that many people through many seasons that have called this place home have been a part of making a difference in this city and around the world. You know, one of the most amazing things about uh, this church and all these kids, by the way, these are the kids who are specifically sponsored by this congregation. Um, so these, this was a VBS party we had for the kids who were sponsored here, providing education, meals uh, for this community. Um, so many of you have been a part of making a difference all the way around the world. And while you may never see any of these people in person, I want you to know it matters. It really, really matters. In fact, this church, after it was opened, I think they were filled to capacity, which is about six, 700, I think, um, within the first six months. <laughs> so pretty amazing, the transformative work that God is doing in Rwanda. Um, as Sarah said, if you are interested in just learning more about this trip or what that looks like, please stop downstairs uh, or grab Fred or Susanna, anyone else you see in these photos. We'd love to tell you more about it. Now, let me invite you to turn in your Bibles. Uh, I'm going to have you turn to a text that I'll get to in a little bit, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, and I want to give a bit of a warning for today, okay? Um, this is a surprisingly challenging topic. It's got a lot of depth to it. it but I want you to know, I honestly believe that this is a, uh, a series that we just started that's going to shape not only what we think about the future, but actually what we think about today. And I'm going to start each one of these weeks. There's only four of them here. I want to start each one of these weeks with our popular concepts of heaven. Okay? Popular concepts that you see in media. Maybe it's something in print. Uh, I, I want us to, to look at some different, you know, scholarly perspectives uh, on what heaven is and what heaven is like. So let me invite you to, to watch this clip here with me today. Just an angel in At least now I can get some west relaxation. <laughs> Let's take some time.
to ask some questions about heaven. Because here's the, the premise of this whole conversation, right? This whole series. Heaven, as you read about in your Bible, turns out to be very different from the Looney Tunes version, okay? And I, I'm not picking on Looney Tunes here. It's actually very different from really any version that you see, anything that we see in, in the movies, media. They, they all seem to get heaven wrong. And so I want to start with just a very basic question. Let me invite you, you know, you can respond to this. On the count of three, even if you're at home, you can still do this. On the count of three, I want you to point to which direction heaven is. One, two, three, go, point. Okay, okay. That seems like that was pretty easy, right? That seemed like a pretty easy answer. Here's the thing. Most of you are wrong. <laughs> and in fact, I, I didn't see uh, a single one that got all of it right. Now, why is that? Because it seems like a pretty obvious question. It seems like a pretty obvious answer. But I want to talk about something that I think is genuinely profound. We're going to ask the question, where is heaven? And I promise you we're going to go from the profound to the practical here. But to start this conversation, I have to say the answer is more complicated than you might expect. All right? It, it seems like you could just be able to go one, two, three, heaven is that way. Right? I mean, that kind of makes sense, right? I mean, that's what happens in Looney Tunes. By the way, do you remember an era when blowing up an animal with dynamite was like kids' comedy? <laughs> can you imagine? Can you imagine if something aired like that today? You know, people lose their minds, right? The answer for heaven, you know, this sort of you die, you hop on this cloud, you're in some sort of a toga. I don't know. That's the you know, close of heaven. Uh, you have a halo, Lots of singing, you're floating on a cloud, right? That, that tends to be the, the conception because heaven is somewhere up in the clouds. But the answer is more complicated than you might expect. And I kid you not, this is one of the most challenging messages I've prepared this year. And I, I really could teach this in about three or four parts. This is how dense this, this thing can be. But even though it's more complicated than you might expect, I actually think it, the answer is more impactful than you might expect. I think that it makes a bigger difference today than most of us are aware of. Now, let's start with this. This is why it's a little bit complex. Um, where is heaven? Okay, well, we have to answer the question, which heaven are you talking about? Because in your Bible, there's at least, when you read the word heaven, there's at least five of them mentioned, okay? Okay. At least five of them mentioned. The first ones are very easy to kind of talk about. It's a translation thing, right? Um, we'll talk about heavens as just the, the sky kind of above us. You know, the birds are flying in the heavens. That sort of use of heaven. Sometimes you'll read that in your Bible. It's not talking about the dwelling place of God. It's the sky. Sometimes the word heaven uh, in your Bible refers to the celestial bodies, right? And the angels appeared in the heavens, uh, it's talking about the stars and, and space. Again, it's a part of, you know, creation as we know it. Something you'd see through a telescope. Sometimes your Bibles will call that heaven. The heavens declare the glories of God. That's a reference to the celestial kind of bodies. Space, if you will. The final frontier. Now, um, the third one is really what most people think of when you hear the word heaven. And that is kind of the, the dwelling place where God is that is in some sort of a different realm. Now, there's even a heaven beyond that, too, that you're going to read in your Bible. So we're going to talk about. But let me just focus on three, three kind of aspects of heaven. We're going to talk about heaven today, okay? Um, you know, if you happen to wake up and there's some cat singing opera in the alley and it's really atrocious and you try some dynamite, it goes bad. This is uh, kind of where you go, okay? This is the heaven today. Then we're going to talk about heaven one day. What will that be like? Then I want to talk about how heaven changes tomorrow. How heaven impacts Monday. Now, your Bible, you could kind of... Uh, split it up in, in three different aspects. 
The first one is Genesis 1 and 2. It's the first kind of segment of the story of God. And God is dwelling with people in a, in a paradise called uh, Eden. And there's Adam and there's Eve and, you know, there's fruitfulness and it's abounding. And, and God has this dwelling place with man in a creation that he has made. Fellowship. Relationship. But sin gets in the way and there's this this falling out and, and mankind is shifted out of paradise into what really the next good portion of your Bible, all the way from Genesis chapter 3, all the way through about Revelation 21. This is that time period where we are in this place where there's this broken relationship with God and there's a brokenness around us. There's, there's death and and injustice and all sorts of things, even, you know, reflecting on 30 years ago, the depth, the depth of sin and evil, right, that we can experience. But the Bible talks about a final stage where actually uh, heaven becomes wedded again with earth and all things are recreated. The heaven of the one day in the future is actually going to be here on earth. Like, I mean, earth, earth. Like Manhattan, okay? It's a place. It's an actual place. And all of that spells something that's so important for my life and for your life today. And in fact, I think that if we can grasp this, and, and it's, it's some work today, okay? I think if we grasp this, it's going to shape how you see the world when you wake up tomorrow. Now, I am going to do what I was told not to do in seminary. Um, if you're not familiar with that, seminary is like the school you go to, to uh, you know, it's not always to become a pastor, but that's frequently kind of the role is. And uh, they teach you how to do some of this stuff. They say, uh, don't get up there and just read really like long, dense portions of text because people can't track with it. Um, I'm going to break that rule today. We're actually going to look at some really challenging, dense text. But I promise you we're going to come up to the thread that runs through it. Now, the first one I want to talk about, these three kind of sections of a heaven today, heaven one day, and heaven tomorrow. Let's talk about what heaven is today because this is what people are most familiar with. And I want you to... Uh, listen to these words. I'll have them on the screen from you from the book of John. This is what Jesus says. He's talking to his disciples. He's about to go to the cross uh, and the very next day. They're very stressed out. Things seem to be going very poorly for them. It, the whole city of Jerusalem is kind of this, you know, powder keg. There's lots of tension. They're up late. They're just very stressed out. And this is what Jesus says. By the way, even though he's the one going to the cross... Jesus is here comforting the disciples in their distress. He says this, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many... How many of you in your mind go, mansions? Right? In my Father's house are many mansions. Some of your translations may say this. Um, Jesus is now talking about the heaven of today that, that we know and we experience. In my Father are many, what's the word here? The whole idea that there's some sort of like mansion up in heaven is actually about how you translate this one word here. Um, I don't know what you imagine when you imagine, you know, what's heaven? Isn't there supposed to be like golden streets and everyone gets like a really big house, you know, with a pool in the back, I assume? I don't know. Do you have to water your lawn? So many questions, right? Um, the word is actually probably better translated, many rooms or dwelling places. You don't necessarily need to think, you know, Americana house. Probably what Jesus is communicating and what they're more familiar with is a Greek or Roman kind of villa style where there's, you know, a central home. There's all these other ones attached. It was pretty common in that day, um, you know, if you were an adult uh, male in particular, and you got married to build another house in kind of a compound, right? This is probably what is more in their minds, not, you know, necessarily, you know, Jeff Bezos' house or something like this, right? Um, but whatever it is, I don't think Jesus is necessarily trying to press the imagery as much as what it means. 
In my father's house are many rooms or homes in a villa or it's probably not mansions, translation. But Jesus is saying there is a place for you. He continues, if it were not so, would I not have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? I mean, I've been pretty honest thus far. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. That where I am, you may be also. And I have to imagine the disciples who are just, I mean, they're, they're so over and concerned and kind of shaky and just not sure what's going to happen. For Jesus to communicate, I'm leaving, but I'm going to a place where there's room for you. And it's not just that there's room for you and you kind of make the guest list because you kind of knew somebody. I am going to be there and I want to dwell with you and you to dwell with me. I don't know what your image of Jesus is. Sometimes it's very stern. It's pain on maybe a tradition or what you've seen. But this very stern kind of like, who let you in? <laughs> sort, of a, sort of a view. Listen to the heartbeat of Jesus on this. He's talking about what what heaven will be, but they don't get it yet. And he says this, which is a little bit of a wry comment. He says, and you know the way to where I'm going. Yeah, they didn't, okay? <laughs> they didn't. Jesus, I don't know if he's like prophetically speaking this to them or speaking it for us, but they were confused, and Thomas kind of voices this. Thomas said to him, Lord, um, kind of looking around, checking just to make sure everyone's nodding here. You said, we know where you're going. Uh, we do not know where you are going. And in fact, how can we even know the way? I mean, they have no clue what he's talking about here. Jesus makes this profound statement. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, where is heaven? Where's heaven today? You know, Jesus talks with his disciples and he says these really profound truths. I am going to prepare a place for you. The crucifixion wasn't an accident. It wasn't a B plan of God that he just kind of made work. This was the plan of God. And in fact, I will argue that him going to prepare a place is not intended to communicate. Jesus is, you know... Somewhere at a mansion, he's like arranging furniture, you know, putting out a welcome basket. I, I don't think that's the point. The actual crucifixion of Jesus is the way that he prepares. His actions over the next, uh, the next few days and, and weeks in his resurrected form become the preparation where death is defeated, where the veil is torn, and where you are invited to be in the dwelling place of God. And Jesus says, I, I am that. We talked last week. Why was the bodily resurrection of Jesus so important? Because it is Jesus who is the way. Just as heaven and earth one day will come back together in its fullness as God intended, so the resurrected yet physical body of Jesus is that marrying of heaven and earth. It becomes a first fruit. It becomes this, this model by which all of us will one day follow. And in all of this, when we say, and, and Paul will communicate this later, he'll say, I want you to know that whenever you pass away today, let me be honest for a moment with you. One of the weird things about being a pastor, there's a lot of weird things about being a pastor. One of the weird things about being a pastor is you journey with people through some real highs and lows, right? You're there for, you know, the baby blessing, which is super cute. Maybe you're doing the premarital council. Maybe you're doing the wedding service. You know, everyone wants a seven-minute sermon today at the weddings. I totally boycott that, people. I, I, feel like, I feel like that's way too short. But, you know, it's all right. It's their wedding. It's their wedding. I'm not going to push it. Um, you're, you're there at these beautiful moments. You know, you're there at the hospital. It's the person who's preparing to die. You're there at the funeral. 
journey with people through all sorts of moments in life. And one of the things that we talk about when we talk about heaven is this idea that those who die and know Jesus and put their faith and trust in Jesus, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. You're not in some kind of a sleep state, you know. The Bible doesn't really talk and doesn't promote that. But that you go to where Jesus is, this place that's being prepared for you in some other realm. I, I don't know what that would be. Uh, you know, there's so little we even know about our own universe. Do you know that over, I believe it's 85% of the universe, we cannot even describe? We can only see because of dark matter, the energy that's off put. We know that something is there, but we literally have no name for it. So we just call it dark matter. The vast majority of the universe, we physically do not have any ability to even see. We just get energy readings, and we know something's out there. Is heaven somewhere out there? Is it a different realm? I don't, I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. But what it does say is that in this heaven, the heaven today, is in a realm with Jesus. And complexities aside, there's just a couple things I want everybody to not miss. One, heaven is where Jesus is. Heaven is where Jesus is. And in fact, when we track with this whole story about there's a God dwelling with people in a garden and we live in this broken experience where these things are, are pulled apart and, and death is a part and injustice is a part of our life. But one day, these things will come back together again. Even the giving of the Holy Spirit is this, this promise of, of a God dwelling with his people again. Right, there's this such rich theology around it, but I don't want anyone to miss that really the heartbeat of heaven is that's where Jesus is. And he says, I go to prepare a place for you, and, I, and I, want, I want you to be there and to dwell with me. Second thing I don't want you to miss in all the theological complexities here, Jesus loves you. I don't know whether you feel... Liked, loved, wanted, invited. But I think the heartbeat of Jesus here is amazing. He's the one who's about to go to the cross. Not the disciples. He says, I want you to know that I'm going somewhere and I want you to dwell with me. And I'm going to come back and get you because I want us to be together. Look, people, it's a commitment to even marry somebody let alone have them live with you for all eternity, okay? <laughs> Jesus deeply loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. And that's the heaven. That's the heaven that most of us think of, right? It is somewhere not on earth, some other realm. It is in the presence of Jesus, in the presence of God. Um, maybe Peter's there at a gate doing questions as you come in. No, that's not true. That's not the Bible at all. Um, but there is this place heaven with God. And for those who have fallen asleep or died, currently, they are there in the presence of the Lord. Now, that's not the final heaven. In fact, that's kind of a transitionary one. Because God has a heaven one day. And I want to talk about this too, because this is the, the final stage of the three. Garden of Eden, the brokenness which we live in now, and ultimately what the work of God's restoration is moving for. And that is a heaven on earth. If you read in the book of Revelation, the, the heavenly city comes down and fuses and unites with this creation. The Bible begins in a garden. The Bible ends in a garden. And the ultimate destination for those who have already gone to heaven or for those of us who are here at the coming again of the Lord Jesus, you will be in a heaven on earth. Like Manhattan or New Jersey. Some, I don't know if Jersey will be there. But, you know, <laughs> places. Places. This is where I get emails, you know, from people. <laughs> okay. It's in a place. Let me talk about heaven one day. And I'm going to read you a text that I promised we would get to from... 
2 Corinthians chapter 5, okay? A couple of key verses will pop up on the screen as I read, but let me just read this for you on our heavenly dwelling. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Pause with me for a moment just so you're not confused from the outset. When Paul says tent, he means his physical flesh. Okay, he's not talking camping, okay? He's talking about the body, the corporeal nature that we have, okay? There's this spiritual aspect to us. There's this physical aspect. He's talking about that when he says tent. You can just translate that in your mind. Verse 2, 4, in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not when we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Pause with me here. Let me give a recap of what Paul is saying. This body that we have, okay, it wears out. It breaks down. All of a sudden, you know, I look at my son and he could like sleep on the floor and wake up feeling great. If I sleep on the floor, like I can't move for the next 30 minutes. Your body breaks down. This physical body that we have, it groans. It's not intended what it should be. Sometimes we paint death as this really friendly thing. Sometimes we paint death as like this sort of, you know, character who comes at night or, you know, Brad Pitt. He did that movie, right? Where he comes and like somehow takes you. And, and death is this kind of nice thing. Death is always the enemy in the Bible. Always the enemy. And we know that there's something so inherent with this. That's why we have such a fear of what's going to happen when we die. Because it's not right. We live in a creation that is not what it was intended to be. It's been marred, defaced by sin, death. And there's this groaning in our bodies. But, now this is the critical point. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. If you're over 45, you go, amen. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. You know what Paul's saying? The goal is not to become Casper the ghost. The better option is not to just get rid of this, you know, physical stuff that breaks down and it gets annoying and, you know, you got to get glasses, whatever else. The point is not to go to be this floating spirit somewhere. In fact, there's this reality to this heavenly body, this resurrected body, that's not less than your physical self. It's more than. So that... What is mortal, this physical, may be swallowed up by life. Do you remember when Jesus was resurrected? That he had some things that were very normal about it? He sat and said, you know, come out of the boat. And Peter jumps and kind of swims. Um, you know, he says, Let, let's build a campfire and let's eat some fish. He's eating. He sits there and says, I, I want you to touch my hands. I, you can put your hand in my side. Physical. He goes, look, I'm not a spirit. A spirit couldn't do these things. Why did that matter? Paul says later here, it's not that the goal is for us to become these spirits. The goal is to be like Jesus, who represents in his physicality the recreation, the remarrying of what was broken, heaven and earth. And that is the true nature of the resurrection to come. There may be this period, but ultimately everybody will come to be recreated in these heavenly bodies. And that matters. Look at how he continues uh, when he talks about this. He says that, verse 5, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. That is in part why the presence of the Holy Spirit is a guarantee in your life. That you are not just this physical, carnal structure. That in this true and really amazing way, 
It's like God dwelling in you, which one day will be true of all creation. You, if you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, are shouting a message of what one day all of creation will be. Look at how it continues. So, we are always of good. What's the word there? I'll give you a hint. It's highlighted on your screen. <laughs> so, we are always of good courage. Courage. Paul goes this really kind of out there idea in theology about how much our physicality and our souls and, and God's creation of the earth, God's ultimate recreation of everything, the, the marrying of these realms which have been separated by sin, right? This really kind of out there theology that you're going, ah, oh, that's really kind of complex and interesting. You know what the point of all this is? So that today, in this moment, you have this deep sense of courage, this deep sense of courage. Look how he continues. We know that while we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, that's the word again, and we'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the, what's the word there? Body, whether good or evil. I don't want us to miss this. Ultimately, what the Bible speaks to is heaven will be life as God intended. This beautiful creation without the presence of sin, without the presence of, of loss and despair and, and pain and entropy. and just, oh, Actually, life is God created. Not just for you, by the way. The Bible says for all of creation. That is why all dogs go to heaven. I, I don't know if that's in the Bible, but it will be life as God intended for it to be. Second thing, heaven will be on earth. The book of Revelation is clear about that. You will still live somewhere on earth. What does that look like? What's your role? What are you going to do? We'll actually talk about that next week. But today, heaven is up there, for those of you who pointed up. Partial credit. One day, heaven is down here. For those who pointed, partial credit. If you did this, you got it right, okay? <laughs> Maybe even this. Depends, depends how you mean it, okay? The last thing I want to say about from 2 Corinthians in the heaven of this one day, today affects heaven. Paul ends this by, by saying to the church in Corinth, an actual place, actual people, and he goes in this conversation about heaven and this one day and our bodies and this tent and now we groan, but one day we'll be united and it's not a less than, it's actually a more than. And so today, I want you to be of good courage. And I want you to realize that every single person is going to stand before God and is going to give an account for what you've done. Sometimes... There's this insidious belief that because heaven is out there someday, right, you can just kind of, you know, use and abuse the, the world here. It's all going to burn anyway, right? Or I, my, my physical body doesn't really matter. I mean, I can just beat this thing into the ground. It makes no difference, right? Because I'm going to, it's like, you know, driving a car like you're running it. You know, it's just you kind of have a different, different vibe. But this idea that we're these disembodied spirits floating in some place that's got no connection or existence to reality is actually bad theology and the opposite of what the Bible is calling you to. One day, you will stand before God and give an account. What did I do with my time? What did I do with, with my opportunity? What did I do with this body that I have? Today affects heaven. Let me start to wrap this by talking about 
heaven on Monday, heaven tomorrow. And, and I want to read an extended passage from 1 Corinthians. And this passage um, is dense. So I'm not expecting you to snag all of it, okay? If you do, see me after, gold star, okay? But I want you to kind of let it wash over you because I want you to feel the points Paul is making. Okay, so I'm going to read this for you. On the resurrection of Christ from 1 Corinthians 15. Now, I want to remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word that I preached, unless you believe in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep, a euphemism for death. Verse 7, then he appeared to James, then to all the disciples. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them. It's kind of an apostle flex there. Then, though, it was not I, but the grace of God that's in me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God that he rose from the dead when he did not raise him from the dead, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, it is in this life only. We are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact... Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by one man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in, in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom of God. The Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and every power, for he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjugation under his feet. But when he says all things are put in subjugation, it is plain that he is not expected who put all things under subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by baptized on behalf of the dead? That's a whole other conversation. If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, but my pride in you, which I have in Christ our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus if the dead are not raised? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. I didn't hear any like, loud clapping or applause or amens or, or anything like this? You guys got all that? Track with all that? Here's what I want you to notice. Paul goes on this very lengthy and, and complex kind of diatribe about why the physical resurrection matters. 
not simply this idea of a disembodied spirit somewhere, while the resurrection at all matters, and then while the resurrection, it's always physical, it's not just a spirit somewhere, it's always physical in your Bibles, why that matters so much. This deep theology, this, this well of just all these thoughts and, and different things about God and subjugation and all these things. And then you know how he ends it? This lengthy, philosophical, very heady theology. There are two views of life. And they're very opposed to each other. And which one you take is going to change how you show up to work tomorrow. The first one is this. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Right? That is called YOLO. All right? For the youths out there using the Google, okay, this concept, I only live once. If that is true, then you better eke out every ounce of good you can get out of life today. And you need to grieve and grieve and grieve the things that you won't see in this life. And when the end of it comes, if this is the only life you have, if there's, you know, there's, you, you just cease to exist or whatever it is, maybe you've never even thought about it. If this is it, it changes everything. Paul says, don't, I don't even understand the point of what we're doing. If there's no life to come, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. But he ends on this. Don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. You ever heard that phrase? Have you ever heard that bad company, you know, it corrupts good morals? You know what we feel like that is about? Youth group, right? Youth group kids. This is what you need to hear because don't go out with girls who drink, smoke, or chew, okay? If you stay away from that, you're good. You're good. Did you know that this comes after one of the most dense theological perspectives on your life to come and on heaven? This is not primarily, Paul in his mind is not thinking teenagers. Don't date jerks. That's not the point. You know the deeper point of this is? The stories we tell ourselves shape our lives today. And if you are surrounding yourself with these people who, who have no view of heaven, who have no perspective of a life to come, and everything is just about today. And, 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 you know, we become like those around us. Paul ends this extended meditation on the life that you will one day have. And he believes that it's something that will change your life today. You know, as the worship team comes up, how... Is thinking about heaven affect Monday? Because that's what Paul's arguing. I'm not talking to teenagers. This isn't a youth group message. What you think about a life to come, Monday. You know what I think that might look like? I think it might look like this deep extended meditation that goes, because one day... I'm going to be with Jesus in a place where I'm secure, loved, experiencing this deep satisfaction, joy. You know what maybe that means? Maybe I don't have to try to eke everything out of Monday that I can. Think through the Lord's Prayer. In fact, maybe this is what you want to do. When you get to your desk on Monday or in your vehicle or the bodega, wherever it is you go. Maybe it sounds like recounting the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. 
your kingdom come. You know what that is? That is a declaration, a, a request of saying this realm of heaven that's up there, the, the heaven of today, but God, I believe it's going to be a heaven someday here on earth. Would you use me to maybe see that just a little bit more now through my actions, through my inactions, through my beliefs? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Marrying these two worlds. God, would you provide for my needs? Give us this day our daily bread. Do you know how much it changes your experience in life if you had a guaranteed life to come where you don't have to worry about bills, you don't have to worry about to have enough for retirement or... Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Do you know I even think a belief about heaven can kind of let you let go of some of the bitterness in your heart. And these people that you feel like I can't even forgive. I mean, from the perspective of eternity, knowing that you have a home in heaven with Jesus and that heaven will be here on earth and it's going to be this timelessness of peace, and beauty, and joy, I think maybe that means I can do a little bit more of this today with my fears and my concerns and my angers. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Heaven affects Monday. So, as we close, I hope that you take some time to answer the question for yourself. Where is heaven? Up, down, both. And I hope you see the beauty and the richness of what one day will be, but not simply for its own sake. That actually you can walk outside and experience the sunshine, which, praise Jesus, it's back. And have this deep sense of peace and joy and eternal perspective to take into your week. You know, one of the ways that we respond here is through taking communion together. If you have put your faith and trust in Christ, if you're a believer, a follower of Jesus, let me invite you to join with us. You don't have to be a member here. Uh, to join us for communion. We have stations of communion up here uh, to your left, my right. We have two in the back as well. If you're at a place where you're just exploring, you're going, I don't really know what I think about all this. Um, I like the Looney Tunes cartoon. I'm not sure about the rest. <laughs> but I'm, first of all, I'm really glad you're here. This is a great place to explore faith, okay? But let me invite you, just take the time to stay seated, reflect, or stand and sing along on the reality of heaven meeting earth through a person named Jesus Christ. We also invite you to come forward for prayer. If we can pray for you, if we can pray for heaven to meet earth in your reality, in, the, in your life and the lives of your loved ones, let me invite you to come up to the cross. However you go about it today, may the reality of heaven break through into your week. Stand with us as we respond.
and with one voice a thousand generations come on sing worthy is the lamb who was slain forever he shall reign oh you reign so let it be today we shout the hymn Let me invite you to uh, join us downstairs, or if you're new, come and see uh, come and see us with Bagels with Brian right outside the door, down to the right. Have a great week. God bless you, and go in peace. <laughs>